shout out to bring our Q Julius, she legend. We're gonna do a joint interview, yeah? Yeah, yeah we'll do a joint interview, Julius. Thanks for the support. You're a legend. Um, from your girls, Raven and Ellie. Welcome to the mother we're covering today's top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. What is our weekend recap of the action at 122 pounds between then both unbeaten champions Ellie Scottney and Sigolene Lafarve for what were the IBF and WBO titles. And as I predicted, as I expected, Ellie Scottney would come out on top. Catfish. My prediction video, I talked about how Ellie is an adaptable fighter, a malleable fighter that can make a series of adjustments for a fight in a variety of situations. So against a taller, longer fighter like Sigolene Lafarve, in all likelihood, it would be Ellie coming forward, crowding the pocket, and letting punches go. That's exactly what we saw in the opening rounds. Ellie had Sigalene under pressure, even though Ellie Scottney is not a pressure fighter. But she fought like one yesterday. She fought like one because she needed to. As the shorter, stumpier fighter of the two, she can't hope to win the fight fighting from the outside. She has to get mid-range to inside, and that's exactly what she did. A conscious effort to crowd Sigalene Lafarve in the pocket and go to her body. From the very beginning. And in the beginning, Sigolene was holding her own, taking a half step back to create space and let punches go, give herself room to work as Ellie was coming forward, tucked behind her guard, inching forward. Catching the shots on the arms and gloves. Now occasionally, Sigolene would get in with a decent right hand. Occasionally. Her punches, however, did not land with the same authority as Ellie's. In spite of Ellie being the noticeably shorter and stumpier fighter, there was more on her punches than Sigolene's, and she consistently stayed with and stayed on top of Sigalene Lafarve, periodically going to her body, drilling her midsection. Either catching and shooting her way in, waiting for Sigalene to throw so she can counter what she throws. Out of the high guard, or jabbing at Sigalene Lafarve, catching her with jabs and double jabs on her way in, then following up. It's more than one way to skin a cat. Sigalene was holding her own at first, but right around round three, you start to see that the pace is catching up to her, that she is getting caught in between the shots as she tries to fend off Ellie Scottney, she's being countered with looping right hands or short left hooks, body shots, all while trying to create distance, but not being given the time, the room, and the real estate to do that as Ellie Scottney was all over her like a cheap suit. It's the most aggressive we've ever seen Ellie Scottney, and we saw shades of this performance one or two fights ago opposite the ring Mary Romero. Ellie took a, a, an aggressive approach with Mary, and she took an even more aggressive approach yesterday with Sigalee. Better on the inside, as I predicted. Better on the inside than Sigalee Lafarve catching and shooting out of the high guard, bobbing and weaving under the sweeping shots as Sigalee She's got longer arms than Ellie Scottney. It's difficult for the taller, longer fighter with longer arms to work within close quarters because they feel all bunched up, whereas Ellie, Ellie was right at home. Short hooks, short body shots. Slipping, rolling, and riding punches, bobbing and weaving, and catching Sigalene Lafarve in between, beating her from the inside out. Drawing out Sigalene Lafarve's lead and countering her, catching her in between while pushing her back. Exhausting. Sigalene was tired. Clever bit of strategy from Ellie Scottney. Getting off to a fast start from the start at the beginning and targeting Sigalene's body at the beginning so that later on she doesn't have her legs under her and she can't get away. She can't create space. Feet are getting heavier and heavier as the fight progresses and Ellie's landing more and more punches on the inside. Two and three punch combinations from the very beginning. It was Ellie Scottney pushing the pace, but she grew even more into the fight as Sigalene wore down, became tired. <laughs> Calculated risk of a ballsy approach. Being the aggressor early on and targeting the body as to cause your opponent to fade down the stretch in the middle and towards the end. Ellie created clear separation between herself and Sigolene Lafarve. She bossed it. What is in keeping with an Ellie Scott knee fight are adjustments and exceeding expectations, making otherwise good fighters, very good and solid fighters, beating them and making it look easy. Fighters other people struggle with. She beat up Sigalene Lafarve yesterday. Beat her up real good, demoralized her, backed her off. The prediction stuck. I picked Ellie Scottney to win a points decision by crowding the pocket and being the better fighter mid-range to inside. That's exactly what she did. And we have to start thinking of Ellie Scottney as a pound for pound entrant, as this is the second world champion she will have taken a belt from. The first was Shernika Johnson for the IBF. This time, it was the WBO. Sigalene Lafarve for the WBO. And these are not close calls or close fights. 
Ellie creates clear separation between herself and her opponents. These are decisive victories. She's in the queue to join the pantheon of fighters already ranked on the Ring IQ pound for pound list. Yesterday, she became this division's first unified Ring Magazine champion in a long while. And I've no doubts she's going to keep an eye on the Eric Cruz versus Nazarena Romero fight for the WBA title. She'll keep an eye out for the winner. She's likely keeping an eye out for Yemi Mercado, this division's WBC champion. Class performance from Ellie Scottney, who never fails to impress me. This was only her ninth professional fight. She's really something. Congratulations to her. Catford. What's Earl been up to, man? <laughs> Fuck Earl. What? Yeah, fuck Eric. Oh, yeah, he ain't with Derrick James no more. Yeah, exactly. You ain't Derrick James. Fuck you, motherfucker. You folded. You didn't want to pay him some money. That's fucked up. It's all business, but still, at the end of the day, some fucked shit up. How I pay him more on a fight I made less. The fuck? Come on, motherfucker. Fuck him. Bro, that's, and he been with you your, your, your whole career. What is wrong with you? What services as unofficial confirmation of all the rumors and gossips that we've been hearing that after many years together, Errol Spence Jr. and Derek James have parted ways and it's because Errol stiffed him on some cash. That he didn't pay him his money or all of his money for his services in preparing Errol for the Terrence Crawford fight. Errol, who seemed very much unprepared, though I don't think there's anything Derek could have done about it. There's no version of Errol Spence that would have won that fight. Ryan, who's still trained by Derek James, has gone on the attack, gone on the attack publicly in a public space he held via X, otherwise known as Twitter. This was yesterday, and in so many words, he confirmed all the rumors that we've been hearing. It doesn't have to be the end of the world that a fighter and a trainer part ways. It's not always unamicable. I mean, Anthony Joshua parted ways with Derek James, but it was professional, Whereas with Errol, it seems personal. Then again, he is still training Errol's fighter. He is training Frank Martin for what is to be the Gervonta Davis fight. And that's going to be pretty fucking awkward if all the rumors and gossips are true and it's the way that Ryan Garcia says it is. It's one thing for Errol, after all this time, to decide that he needs something new in his corner, something fresh. Because he might. That he's reached the end of the road with Derek James and Derek can't add anything new to his toolbox. So he's going elsewhere. It's one thing to do that, but it's another thing entirely to stiff him on his money. It's what Gennady Golovkin did to Abel Sanchez when he struck that DAZN deal. It's worth a lot of fucking money. Gennady really cleaned up upon crossing the street from HBO, the now defunct HBO Boxing, over to DAZN, and apparently he got greedy, and he didn't want to pay Abel, at least pay him more. He was never the same after he parted ways with Abel Sanchez. He enlisted the aid of Jonathan Banks, a more cerebral trainer for what is a more cerebral fighter, and he was never the same Gennady after that. That. It happens. But it seems to be happening with Errol Spence Jr. and Derek James. Rumor has it that Derek's going to take him to court for the money that he's owed. And we'll see if that's the story that time tells. But it is unfortunate that after preparing a guy for so many fights, so many times, that much time with a fighter, what seems like a rapport, a bond. Money changes, people. I believe it was Nesta Gibbs of The Boxing Voice who speculated that Ryan Garcia and Anthony Joshua, in the short time that they had and have been with Derek James, are actually paying him more than Errol is. Was. Or was. And that just doesn't seem right. He put more time and attention in Errol's career than he had in theirs. Does Errol Spence Jr. blame Derek James for the way that the Crawford fight went? Because there's not a lot that Derek James could have done about that. You were never a better fighter than that guy, and you were never gonna be. Crawling out of a bottle of cognac in between fights, crashing Lamborghinis, it was never gonna happen. Your own self-discipline is really up to you, not your trainer, not nobody else. But hey. Like how Roly Romero split with his longtime coach, Coach Bullet, or Gennady Golovkin split with his longtime coach, Coach Abel Sanchez, Errol split with Derek James, which is not really new news. But how does he expect to be ready for the likes of Sebastian Fundora if he's lucky enough to fight him, breaking in a new trainer, experimenting with a new corner, and a new style? How? Coming up on a year since that Crawford fight, it could be well in between a year's time in between Errol's last fight and his next fight, because we're closer to July of this year than July of last year. Didn't he once say that he's in the sport of boxing for a good time, but not a long one? Well, it looks that way.
through another Demetrius Andre moment. You know what I'm saying? The same How? thing. With, Andre, you know listen, I mean? can we agree that Andre and Boots are two different people in terms of popularity? A stud observation, and in terms of style, they don't fight the same. Yeah, but, you know what I'm saying, Andre, he didn't deliver the fights. You know what I'm saying? It's the reason why Andre popularity didn't rise, because he didn't deliver the fights for Andre. Yeah, and Andre didn't deliver the performances for Eddie Hearn, for the banner. He didn't deliver the kind of performances that would have and could have and should have made him a more popular fighter. Nah, is is a reason he couldn't deliver because he didn't have the popularity. Boots has the popularity and the hardware. It's different. Bro, you can't tell me that Andre popularity had it been done correctly wouldn't have been. Better. I mean, I mean, you talking than, but, done correctly? I'm talking reality. Reality is Andre ain't never but, been but, or will be. But that's the reality. Than Boots. The, rea the reality is he he wasn't promoted right, and they didn't get they didn't get him to fight. No, the reality is that Demetrius Andre was promoted by three separate promotional outfits and not a single one of them was able to make him popular whether it was star promotions or matchroom promotions or the pbc afterwards enough with the violins i mean that's simple i mean, I mean again bro. again you can't blame matchroom for not promoting a dude that was already damn near 30 let's get something straight Demetrius Andre is best described as a rather herky-jerky pure boxer who fights a safety first fight and really isn't big on power and never has been. He's not a knockout merchant. That doesn't help his marketability. Whereas Jaron Boots Ennis is best described as a rather big and strong boxer puncher. Which does help his marketability. Because you would sooner get a knockout from watching a boxer puncher in action than watching a pure boxer in action who's fighting on his toes and using his jab, not taking very many risks. How to fight a fight is pretty fucking important, you know. And Demetrius Andre don't fight like boots. They don't fight the same, so one guy really isn't a parallel for the other and how matchroom may be able to help that fighter demetrius andre in and of himself is not the best example of what matchroom can do for a fighter because demetrius was with more than one promotional outfit not just matchroom not just eddie hearn he was with joe de guardia of star promotions for a number of years joe couldn't turn him into a star no nope. eddie couldn't turn him into a star afterwards and after that when he went to the pbc they didn't do it either so does it really boil down to the promotion when he was with three separate promotional outfits or is it just that this fighter is not a marketable fighter he never was and he's hardly a parallel for Jaron Ennis. Jaron Ennis who just signed a multi-fight deal to Matchroom. Some people are excited, some people aren't because they think this deal is gonna go the same as Demetrius Andrade's deal. But I beg to differ because there's a part of the story that Demetrius Andrade's remaining supporters don't like to tell. The grocery list of fighters that he turned down because he thought he was too good for them. Anyone from Matvey Karabov to Arislandi Lara to Sergei Divyanchenko. Did you forget about them? Daniel Jacobs, Yanni Alan Kanalai, Zach Parker. He pulled out of the Zach Parker fight more than once. He pulled out of so many fights and turned down so many fights that in his mid-30s, he found himself painted into a corner where his only viable option was a David Benavidez fight. Pulled out of the Charlo fight years ago. Now you can delve deeper into what exactly his rationale was, and I'm sure that there's going to be some lofty explanation what's supposed to be a good reason for his career having went the way it went. But that's why we're here, and that's why he's not marketable. No matter who's marketing his fights, whether it's Star Promotions, Matchroom, or the PBC. Oh, it's everybody else's fault that nobody wants to watch him. It's always somebody else's fault, except the fighters. In your version of the story, I mean, I would have liked to have seen Demetrius fight Yanni Bek Alam Kanalai. Remember, he was ordered to fight him as his mandatory challenger, and Demetrius thought he was too good for that fight. Oddly enough... He stood a better chance beating Yanni Beck than he did beating David. But he didn't want to fight Yanni Beck. He told the WBO he was going to be moving up to 168. He was going to fight Zach Parker for WBO interim status. He supposedly got injured, which I never believed. I still don't. He comes back to the table, and now the Zach Parker fight is worth a lot less money for him than it was before. Why don't you believe him? Because I don't think he wanted to travel. The Zach Parker fight was supposed to go down in Zach Parker's neck of the woods as a Queensbury promotion. And I don't think Demetrius wanted to go over there for that fight. But he did want to hold his position. He did want to hold his status via the WBO. So he tells them that he's injured. All the while, he really wasn't. He comes back to the table, and when he comes back, there's a lot less in it for him. There's a lot less money on the table now than there was before. So he decides to forego that route altogether. 
He washes up on the shores of PBC Island, has a keep busy fight with Desmond Nicholson and puts forth a lackluster showing, a lackluster performance. For God's sake, Edgar Berlunga did better against that guy than Demetrius did. To your point, my point is that not every halfway decent fighter with two feet under him and a jab is made for TV. Shells out TV friendly, fan friendly performances. Some of these guys, you can't sell them. Doesn't matter who's promoting them. You can't sell them. You can't pour sugar on shit and think it's gonna make it all better because it's still shit. I'm not here to be nice. Or we'll play him the violin for you to tell me that it's Matchroom's fault that this guy never popped that's a lot of bullshit. Spare me. Demetrius Andre didn't have a fan-friendly TV style. And you know who else doesn't have the most fan-friendly TV style? Sonny Edwards. Last year, Sonny Edwards suffered a knockout loss just like Demetrius, but Sonny's already got a fight book. It's not an easy one either. Sonny Edwards, who's a mover, a jabber, a pure boxer, just like Demetrius. He's a thinking man's fighter, a cerebral fighter. But think about it. Sonny Edwards did something that your average American fighter wouldn't do. He came to America as an unbeaten champion to unify titles with Bam. And while it didn't work out, it didn't stop him from hitting the ground running. It didn't stop him from getting back on the horse. Now he's set to fight on the undercard of Bam Rodriguez versus Gallo Estrada against Curiel. It's a good fight. And it's a good card. It's that kind of risk taking that pays dividends. Yes, it is a gamble, but if it works out, it pays off. Whereas playing it safe in the world of boxing, you think the fans won't notice? You think you're gonna get people excited about you, excited about your career? when that's what you're doing. You didn't want to fight Yanni Beck because you said you were going to move up and fight Zack Parker, then you don't fight Zack Parker to fight a fucking journeyman. That's your fault, not Eddie's, not nobody else's. Eddie wasn't even in the picture by the time all that happened. You had a choice, and you made it. They want to make him out to be a hard luck case. Well, newsflash, not everybody's going to be a star in the sport of boxing. Not every guy with two hands and two feet. No. If American boxing fans wanted to support Demetrius, Nothing was stopping them. Nothing was stopping you guys from watching his fights and flocking out to his fights in droves. You just didn't want to, so that when he doesn't pop, you can blame the promoter. Ain't that about a bitch. Like you're entitled to fans, or you're entitled to having marquee value, that it's just the promoter's job to entertain, and the fighter doesn't have his role to play in this, and how he performs, and what kind of performances he or she shells out. That matters too, you know. Not all fighters are created equal, and not all situations, not when it comes to Demetrius. There were some fights that Matchroom tried desperately to deliver him, but they couldn't get the other guys to play ball because he ain't got no marquee value. So why he ain't got no marquee value? Because you guys aren't supporting him, you're just belly aching online. You're just using him to shade another fighter or shade other fighters. That's all you did for Demetrius. That's all you do with a lot of guys if we're honest. You don't actually support them. You don't actually show up anywhere in the numbers and you think you're telling me something. You're not. Demetrius is not marketable. He wasn't marketable before he got with Matchroom and he wasn't marketable afterwards. And that's reality.